Paul Bloom is a best-selling author, a professor of psychology at the University of Toronto, and a professor emeritus at Yale University. He studies how children and adults make sense of the world with a special focus on pleasure, morality, religion, fiction, and art. Paul has won numerous awards for his research and teaching. He is past president of the Society for Philosophy and Psychology and co-editor of Behavioral and Brain Sciences. He has written for scientific journals such as Nature and Science and for popular outlets such as the New York Times, The Guardian, The New Yorker, and The Atlantic Monthly. Paul is the author of six books, including his most recent, The Sweet Spot, The Pleasures of Suffering and The Search for Meaning, which he will give a talk on today. You can keep up to date with Paul's work at www.paulbloom.net. So, Paul, I'm absolutely thrilled to have you here with us today. Um, whenever you're ready, uh, feel free to get started and best of luck. Thank you for having me here. Thanks for the introduction um, and thank you all for, for attending. Several years ago, the art critic James Elkins put ads in newspapers and magazines asking people to send uh, him stories about paintings that made them cry. And he put together these stories in this wonderful book, Pictures and Tears. Now, some of the stories kind of made sense. People were driven to tears by paintings that depicted the sorts of things that if they were to see them in the real world would make them cry. Depictions of loss and death, the savagery of war. Sometimes these paintings had a personal resonance. An English professor wrote Elkins describing a painting of an empty bed that his wife made. And, um, uh, month after leaving it, she left him for another man. So he's alone in his apartment. He looks at the painting. He thinks about what it means and he begins to cry. Some of the paintings are more mysterious. So the paintings that made the most people cry in the letters to Elkins were these giant purplish black canvases in a, ca in a chapel in uh, Houston, Texas. And they were done by Mark Rothko. And people would sit on those benches and stare at the paintings and think about what they mean and they would begin to weep. And part of their sadness was probably because they knew that Rothko killed himself soon afterwards. It's not just, um, it's not just paintings that give rise to, to, to sadness. Um, sometimes we, we seek out sad songs. Uh, for me, the music of Adele sometimes does it, where, where they make us sad and yet we pursue them. And as a psychologist, there are so many mysteries here. But the main one I'm, I'm interested in is, why do we seek out bad experiences? Why do we seek out the sadness and the, the horror evoked by some paintings and some songs? And this, um, this is brought up in the sharpest relief with regard to stories. So David Hume once wrote long ago, he introduced what's now been called the paradox of tragedy, where he writes, it seems an unaccountable pleasure which the spectators of a well-written tragedy receive from sorrow, terror, anxiety, and other passions that are in themselves disagreeable and uneasy. You could think here about tragedies like Macbeth. We could also think here about uh, horror movies like Psycho or like Saw, so-called uh, torture porn. Why, what, what's the appeal of these things? Why are we drawn to, to experiences that are so normally negative and unpleasant? Um, it's not just adults. In his book, The Storytelling Animal, Jonathan Gottschall points out that children seem to have the same draw. So he gives a description of some stories that children uh, wrote. Um, trains running over puppies and kittens, a naughty girl being sent to jail, a baby bunny playing with fire and burning down his house, a little boy slaughtering his whole family with a bow and arrow, and so on. These are the sort of stories we, we produce and that we like, but even in our heads, when we think about things, we're often drawn towards the negative. So there's a lovely study by Killingworth and Gilbert where they give people an iPhone app that goes off at random times. And when it goes off, people have to answer two questions. One question is, are you present in the moment or is your mind wandering? Are you fantasizing or thinking about the past or thinking about the future? And the second question is, how much fun are you having? How happy are you? And what they find is illustrated in their title. When people mind are wandering, when they're free to think about anything they want, they tend to go to the bad stuff. Now, when Hume characterized this problem, this, this puzzle, he did it in terms of uh, tragedies, of fiction. And a lot of people, when they think about the sort of, why are we drawn towards the negative? They think in this way as well. Uh, Samuel Johnson, uh, the biographer of Shakespeare wrote, the delight of tragedy 
proceeds from our consciousness of fiction. If we thought murders and treasons real, they would please no more. Now, he was a brilliant man, but he was certainly wrong. We have the same appeal, this, there's the same appeal of the negative for things we know perfectly well are real. Um, we, we are drawn towards true stories of cruelty and, 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 and pain and loss. Um, this shows up in all sorts of ways. My favorite personal example was I was driving to work um, down Whitney Avenue. I'm in my car and I look out the passenger side window and I see that thing. And it struck me so much that I zoomed in on it. Um, it says gruesome details. And why would a newspaper put on a heading gruesome details? Because they want people to buy the newspaper. Gruesome details sell. We also seek out pain and discomfort and anxiety and struggle in the real world, not just in fantasy. Um, many people like hot peppers, a uniquely human pleasure, and it's kind of puzzling. We like roller coaster rides. Um, Paul Rosen did a survey and finds that your mileage may vary, but everybody seems to like something from a list like this. Spicy food, sweating, um, massage pain, uh, physical exhaustion, bitter foods, and so on. This also shows up in, uh, in sexual pleasure. So it's difficult to get an exact read for how many people take pleasure from uh, BDSM or sadomasochistic sex. But we do know there's an interest in it, and at least an interest in fantasizing about or hearing about it. Um, the most popular book in the last decade, from 2010, 2020, was Fifty Shades of Grey, which is a story of sadomasochistic sex. The second most popular book was the sequel, and the third most popular book was the end of the trilogy. So I'm interested in this. Where is our desire um, where does this desire, this appetite for bad things come from? And what does it tell us about human nature? Well, to start off, I think certain forms of suffering can satisfy social goals. So a lot of times we put ourselves in painful circumstances um, in order to show others how tough we are, or alternatively as a cry for help. A lot of times when people do things like eat spicy foods or go through physical endurance, they do so as a way to... to, 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 to they, they don't do so by themselves, they do so with groups to send a message. Sometimes um, suffering can bring groups together and it shows up in religious rituals. Um, in, uh, in the Philippines, for instance, where people will crucify themselves in a celebration of Lent. In, uh, uh, in the island of Mauritius, um, there's, a, there's a ritual and part of a festival where people will have their bodies skewered by, uh, by, by spears, and they will have hooks put onto their chest, and then the hooks would be attached to a heavy chariot, and these men would drag the heavy chariot uh, through town and up a high mountain. Now, these are extreme examples, but every major religion, every the religions that I bet many of you practice, involves some degree of suffering and deprivation. And there's different theories as to what's driving this, but one theory is that it brings groups together. That shared suffering, again, instills common purpose, instills a love of the group, an idea presented by Emil Durkheim. And in some lovely research, um, Demetrius Igalatis and his colleagues find that people who observe these struggles uh, and participate in them tend to give more to the group. They tend to be more committed to the group when they, when they, they watch somebody doing a high ordeal thing than a low ordeal thing. I think that's one aspect of it. Suffering can be social. A second aspect of it is suffering can enhance pleasure. So you can do this in different ways. One way is through contrast. Uh, so there's, there's some lovely work by, uh, by, by Lackness and colleagues where, um, where they give people um, a certain experience that's kind of painful. And in the absence of anything else, people say it's painful, ouch. And maybe it's putting their hands in ice cold water or mild electric shocks. They say, ouch, painful. But if this experience, if they're expecting the experience to be more painful than it is, as a result of the contrast, this experience becomes pleasant. It's understood relative to, uh, to, to what came before it and what, expect, what, what they expected. And I think this is part of what goes on in things like the pleasure of uh, saunas or spicy foods, which is they're very painful. They, they damage the body, they, 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 they cause what normally would be unpleasant, 
but then they're followed by a moment of release, like um, diving into cold water after the sauna or drinking a cool beer um, after eating spicy foods. And this, and this release causes such a bump in pleasure that it makes up for the pain that preceded it. It's like this joke my dad used to tell me about the guy who was banging his head against the wall. And when somebody asked him, why are you doing that? He said, it feels so good when I stop. A second way in which suffering can enhance pleasure is it could be a sort of escape from the self. So um, this shows up in many analysis of BDSM where, you know, we all carry on this consciousness, this voice in our head, this feeling of what we are. And certain forms of pain and play acting can take us away from that. And that could be blissful. It's, it's a way of getting what experienced meditators talk about, but through a very different route. Um, this shows up particularly for high intensity exercise. So you talk to a, I don't know, a cyclist, for instance, and, uh, and, and, and they'll tell you that during the moments of intense, the most intense exertion, the full out exertion, very, very painful, a lot of suffering, but blissful too. And it takes their mind away from everything. Finally, more generally, we can take pleasure in experiencing negative emotions. And that seems might seem weird. You might think that, um, that well, this is how, um, how David Hume put the puzzle where he said sorrow, terror, anxiety, and other passions are in themselves disagreeable and, and uneasy. I mean, he thought of it as this is inherently bad. But he wasn't right. There's a better way of thinking about it. And this is actually defended very nicely in the recent book by Lisa Feldman Barrett, where emotions are not themselves good or bad. It depends on the context uh, in which you experience them. So imagine being... Uh, being charged by a ferocious animal and you're terrified. And the question is, this is plainly an unpleasant situation, but why is it unpleasant? I wanna suggest that it's unpleasant, not because of the fear itself, but because of the risk of the worry about being maimed or killed. If you could experience the same emotional feeling, the fear, without the actual worry, this could be a lot of fun. Like if you're in a virtual reality thing, and in fact, people seek out being afraid. We go to horror movies, we go to haunted houses, because we could take pleasure in the fear, so long as it's not accompanied by actual, real uh, worry about ourselves. Similarly, anger is typically an aversive experience, because we're typically angry when something has gone wrong. We're angry at cruelty and injustice. But you can also feel anger at something that you imagine or you could at a, a, a fantasy, at an idea, or you could blow up your anger at a small concept, at a small event and take pleasure in it. Um, sadness is typically a bad feeling, but everybody enjoys sulking sometimes, nurturing some sadness, because you know it's not really that bad and you kind of nurture the experience. And this is true for something like, um, even like physical pain and physical suffering. Um, I, um, I ran the New York Marathon a long, long, long time ago. And at the end of it, I was not in the best shape starting off. And at the end of it, I was, I was exhausted. My heart was pounding. I was breathing hard. If all of a sudden I started to feel that way right now, as I were talk, was talking to you, um, it'd be the worst experience of my life. I'd feel like I'm having a heart attack. But um, in the context of what I was doing, where I fully understood why I was feeling this way, and I, it, was, it was a moment of great accomplishment to me, it felt wonderful. Um, the idea here is nicely summarized uh, by Shakespeare, who wrote, there's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. I think, though, we talked about, about suffering and social goals as a source of pleasure. But what, I, what I'm most interested in is how suffering can often satisfy other goals that people have. And this is part of its appeal. So one goal is practice. So um, humans and other animals often play. We do things like, um, like play fight. And one good evolutionary explanation for this is this play is a form of practice. So it's really useful to be able to fight. Uh, one way to get good at fighting is uh, to fight, to, get, to, to do it over and over again. But real fighting is dangerous. You get killed, you get hurt. You could hurt or kill somebody else. 
So evolution came up with an incredibly clever trick, which other animals have as well, of playing at fighting, going through some of the motions of fighting, but holding back with people you trust, with other, other members of your species you trust. And this is a way of getting good at something by doing it over and over again um, without some of the risks it carries from actually doing it. And I think this is what we do in our imaginations. I think we are drawn to think about worst case scenarios um, as a way of preparing ourselves for when they might actually happen in the real world. Uh, one analogy I like is that of a flight simulator. So people want to get good at flying. Um, one way to get good at flying is to do a lot of flying. But one of the risks of doing a lot of flying is that you could crash early on. So we've created flight simulators. And, um, and this is a way of practicing at the real thing without actually doing it. And, um, and you don't always program a flight simulator for a safe flight. You program a flight simulator for trouble. So that when real trouble comes by, you're ready for it. And I think the mind, the imagination works the same way, where our imagination seeks out trouble and um, as a way to prepare for the future. The idea is not original. To me, Stephen King, the great horror writer, put it like this. We make up imaginary horrors to help us deal with real ones. And from this perspective, the draw of horror kind of makes sense. You think about all of the appeal of zombie movies and, um, and zombie TV shows and zombie books and everything. It's not to prepare us for the upcoming zombie apocalypse. But what these depictions really do is they depict a world where, um, where there's no law, there's no government. The real danger in zombie movies is very rarely the zombies. It's always the people. And um, and this these movies, these, we're drawn to this depiction because the, a world without law, without government, is something that we sort of, at some level, think about and worry about. Another appeal to suffering is that it's part and parcel of mastery and flow. So this is this gets us to what's called the effort paradox, um, coined by my friend Nikki Ensel at the University of Toronto. The effort paradox goes like this. Animals, including humans, really like to reduce the amount of effort we, we go through. We try to make things easy. Um, we try to take the shortest distance between two points. We try to reduce the amount of, of difficulty and time and caloric expenditure and so on. Except when we don't. Except when we often seek out effort, seemingly for its own sake. And we know a couple of things about how it works. We know that effort, um, that when you work at something, at creating something, the more you work to create it is um, the more value it has. So um, uh, Mike Norton and his colleagues uh, coined what they call the Ikea effect, which is that when you create an object, um, you, you'll pay more for that object subsequently than for the same object that someone else is just ready to hand you. Putting effort in something increases its value. We also just enjoy effort for its own sake. Um, a perfectly small example of this is that like a lot of people, I like crossword puzzles. I don't do it uh, well enough to, um, to attract mates or, or to impress people or do anything like that. I just enjoy doing it. And I don't just enjoy doing the easy ones, which I can finish easily. I enjoy the difficult ones that I typically don't solve. But the struggle is part of, part of the point. Um, this idea was developed, I think, most thoroughly by the, the psychologist Mahali uh, Csikszentmihalyi who talked about what he called flow experiences. And flow experiences are experiences involving difficulty. Um, they're kind of Cinderella sweet spot experiences, which are not so easy, you get bored, but not so difficult that you get um, anxious and, and overwhelmed. Um, and um, you know you're in a flow experience when, um, when you lose track of time, when you forget to pick up the kids, you forget to eat. And some people spend much of their lives in flow experience. Professional athletes and musicians are often in states of flow. And something about our psychologies finds these states of flow, which are not easy, which are not simple pleasures, immensely appealing. Another reason why we seek out suffering is that it's part and parcel of our moral natures. So um, my day job as a, as a developmental psychologist looks at the origin of morality in babies and children. And, um, and there's some evidence for some sort of moral instinct or moral drive early on. Um, some studies find, for instance, that these are old school studies from the 80s, 
Um, when somebody, uh, an experimenter or a mother pretends to be in some sort of pain or hurt, children will often spontaneously act to help them. The morality, the, the, the suffering of another is, 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 is something which motivates them to want to make things uh, better. Um, a nice example of this comes from a study by, uh, by uh, Felix Varnikin and Michael Tomasello, where they put a kid in a room and, uh, and let him um, uh, showed him somebody in trouble. And the question is, with nobody prompting the kid, would the kid spontaneously help? And here's a clip from uh, one of her studies. Oh. Hmm. Oh. I've been interested in my own work in what you could call the dark side of suffering, uh, sorry, the dark side of morality, um, where our moral intuitions and drives and capacities motivate us to want to suffer or make others suffer. Um, and um, a simple example comes from um, comes from a study uh, by my, two of my Yale colleagues, Arbor Tassimi and Karen Wynn. And uh, they did a study with babies, of actually with, uh, I think, 13 month olds. And the, the design was pretty simple. They would set up a situation where um, the baby could crawl to one of, two, uh, one of two plates. And one plate has one cracker and the other plate has two crackers. So babies enjoy crackers. Uh, they could tell one from two apart. And so they crawl to the two crackers. So you say that's kind of interesting, but not, not so surprising. But then the twist is they, um, they have um, somebody who's a nice guy, um, a good character, um, offer the one character, the one cracker. He's helped people before they watch the babies watch as the kid helps. Another one who's mean offers the two crackers. And they find that uh, babies will not, do not want to deal with the devil. They'll override their temptation to go for more to interact with the nice guy. Uh, you might wonder how powerful this effect is. It's not limitlessly powerful. If the mean guy offers eight and the nice guy offers one, babies are not perfect. They will go towards the mean guy. In general, we not only want to avoid bad characters, we want them to suffer. Um, there's a tremendous pleasure in seeing bad guys get theirs. And this is uh, the topic of, of countless movies and countless stories. I have two books on my bookshelf um, each to, that purports to, to describe the majority of English language literature. And one is called Comeuppance and the other one is called Revenge Tragedy. There's, um, there's more to this, which is often we want to suffer as part and parcel of a moral act. What I mean by this is that we, we associate goodness with suffering. Some of you might remember a few years ago, there was the Ice Bucket Challenge where um, to, to raise money for treatment of, of a terrible disease, people would pour ice water over their heads. And you say, why would they do that? Why did it work that way? Why didn't they uh, have uh, massages or delicious meals? And the answer is because uh, there's a lot of research suggesting that when, when, when pain is associated, like a, mat, like a run or ice water over your head or something like that, it makes people more pro-social. Equivalently, when people are... Um, do good stuff, but they profit from it. As, it, as when a businessman may, uh, might make the world better in some way, but makes money off of it, or somebody uh, helps with the homeless, as done in the study, but, um, but enjoys it and makes friends with other volunteers, the goodness is downgraded. We wanna see self-sacrificial goodness. If you're having too much fun, your altruism is tainted. And we see again that morality and suffering are intimately tied together. Finally, and this will connect with uh, uh, the next speaker and, and all sorts of interesting issues, suffering is tied to meaning. And, um, and in fact, here, I think um, Hume gets it wrong. He talks about unaccountable pleasure. But to some extent, a lot of suffering isn't, doesn't have to do with pleasure at all. It has to do with another goal. So um, take mountain climbing. I like mountain climbing because uh, George Lowenstein, uh, a great behavioral economist, wrote a wonderful case study of this, 
where he points out that endurance mountain climbing, like you can climb Everest or something like that, is a terrible experience by all reports. Climbers have blinding headaches through most of it. There's physical exhaustion. There's tremendous boredom. There's, there's, there's physical, there's great risk. Um, he summed it up as harshly uncomfortable, miserable, and exhausting. Yet people like it, and they do it over and over again. And I think an answer is that they don't do it for pleasure. They do it because at some level, it's considered important and meaningful and valuable. And many of us don't do that sort of thing, but some of us might have children. And um, these are my two sons when they were much younger, um, Max and Zachary. Uh, my youngest son has a black eye because of the school picture day. So my older son punched him in the eye. Um, and having children is, a psychologist has been fascinated by the effects of having children. And it's kind of a, a mixed bag. So um, Jennifer Sr. summarizes uh, some of the research suggesting that um, if you, sound, you do experience sampling of the sort I described before where an iPhone beeps at random times, and when it beeps, you say how happy you are. There's some evidence for at least, in at least some countries, for at least some people, having kids is a negative. It's more, you have more pleasure in your life when you don't have kids. Kids, particularly young kids, being with them is actually not enjoyable or not pleasurable. We also know that having kids is murder on relationships. Um, this is a summary of uh, four studies by the psychologist Dan Gilbert, where he points out that when people are married without kids, they're pretty happy with their marriage. Kids come in and they get sad and sad and sad until teen their kids are teenagers and they're miserable. And then once kids start leaving the house, the marriage starts to recover and people are happier and happier. As he puts it, the only known syndrome symptom of empty nest syndrome is increased smiling. Finally, as a third example, take an extreme example, take the psychologies of people who, who join an apocalyptic death cult, like ISIS. What's going on in this? The, the writer Joyce Carol Oates uh, tweeted many years ago, um, all we hear of ISIS is puritanical and punitive. Is there nothing celebratory and joyous? Or is query naive? And a lot of people were very offended that she would ask whether there's something celebratory and meaningful about ISIS. But, but there plainly is. And what's going on here was actually nicely summarized by George Orwell in a review of Mein Kampf. And Orwell talks about what Hitler got right. Wrote, Hitler knows that human beings don't only want comfort, safety, short working hours, hygiene. They also want struggle and self-sacrifice. Whereas socialism and capitalism has said to people, I offer you a good time. Hitler has said to them, I offer you struggle, danger, and death. And as a result, a whole nation flings itself at his feet. We don't go to war, most people in our modern cultures, and we try to avoid it, but we, but we, um, we fantasize about it. Our great entertainments are battles between good and evil, as in the superhero movies that are become so incredibly popular, or the video games that, that are even more popular than the movies and are so often battle simulations. We seem to want the sort of meaning and purpose that war gives us without ever experiencing it. I don't think we're hedonists. I think, um, I think a good psychological theory says we're motivated by more than pleasure. What we, often, what we pursue often requires pain and suffering. Um, we have other goals and suffering emerges from the pursuit of these goals. But I wanna stop briefly. Everything I'm saying is about chosen suffering. Chosen suffering can be social, can give us social signal, can give us pleasure, can be part of play, can, can be part of mastery and flow, can be part of meaning. What about unchosen suffering? Um, here's an example. We, we seem to have certain ideas about unchosen suffering. Um, here's one example. Um, it's the story of James Costello. So James Costello was at the Boston uh, Marathon a few years ago to witness um, friends going through the finish line when all sorts of when bombs went off that were set off by terrorists. And uh, he was uh, severely burned, ended up in a hospital for several months where he met a nurse and they fell in love and they got married. And on the day of his marriage, Costello posted this on Facebook. I now realize why I was involved in the tragedy. It was to meet my best friend and the love of my life. And there's a certain phrase which comes out here, you may have heard, everything happens for a reason. 
my colleagues and my students and I have always been interested in why do we sort of provide reasons for, try to find reasons and rationality for unchosen suffering. Now, some would say that's just uh, religious, that religion provides you with this. Um, if you don't have a religious view, you say it's just physics, it's, there's no purpose to it. Um, I think there's some truth to that, but I think it's more complicated. And in collaboration with, uh, with uh, Konika Banerjee, then a student of mine, we did a series of studies where we asked people about meaning in life. So in one study, we asked people um, to remember an event in their life, a major event in life. Could be positive, like a, having a, a baby or getting married. Could be negative, like the death of a loved one or a serious illness. And then we talked to both theists, people who believed in God and atheists, and we asked them questions. We asked them, did, was this event caused by fate? Was it meant to be? Did it happen for a reason? Did it happen to send me a message? And here are our findings from one of the studies. And you'll see two things. One thing is, as you would expect, people who are religious were more prone to see meaning in unchosen suffering. We also see that depending on how the question was asked, even people who have no religious belief at all um, tended to see these things as happening for a purpose. It seemed that there's an appetite to try to find meaning in, in forms of suffering that are not chosen. But like I said, it's most accelerated in terms of religion. And some have proposed that the purpose of religion, why we have it in the first place, is at least in part to, to explain, to justify, to soothe us about the troubles, uh, about unchosen suffering. Um, this is taken for an ex to certain extremes. My favorite example of an extreme is, uh, through, is about the story of William Atkinson. William Atkinson was the first president of the American Dental Association. And he was president at a time when anesthesia was coming in. And you might think that, um, that anesthesia is one of the sort of unquestioned goods of the world, but not for Atkinson. He wrote, I wish there were no such thing as anesthesia. I do not think men should be prevented from passing through what God intended them to endure. There is um, a genre of, uh, of postcards in England um, a couple of decades ago, where, um, which, which shows uh, uh, children, uh, typically shows wonderful seaside scenes, uh, children cavorting and having a good time and all sorts of happiness. And there are many psychologists and many people who think this is a great description of human nature. Um, and uh, uh, this is what we aspire to. And if anything, I would hope that my talk has convinced you it's more complicated than that. We often seek out pain and suffering. We seek this in terms of, in the context of religious rituals, in term, in context of sex, in the, in the pleasures we take in fiction, in, uh, in the pursuits we engage in, in our activities, both uh, terrible and very good, that we have an appetite for suffering. And I think this is consistent with a sort of different theory of human nature which we could call motivational pluralism. And I like the summary by the um, economist Tyler Cowen, who writes, what's good about an individual human life can't be boiled down to any single value. It's not all about beauty or all about justice or all about happiness. Pluralist theories are more plausible, postulating a variety of relevant values, including human well-being, justice, fairness, beauty, the artistic peaks of human achievement, the quality of mercy, and the many different and indeed sometimes contrasting kinds of happiness. Life is complicated. Um, one illustration of how life could be complicated is that we have to navigate these different motivations we have. So for instance, we have to navigate the appetite we have for happiness and pleasure, which is a genuine, powerful appetite, um, with uh, other appetites we have. And, um, and one illustration of this is um, uh, recent studies, uh, actually studied for a long time, but, but I'll talk about recent data, over the happiest countries. So here are the happiest countries in the world, Finland, Norway, Denmark, and so on. Um, and maybe you aren't surprised to see this list. These are rich countries. They are countries with good social support systems, with good environments for business, with um, a lot of trust in the community and so on. And so we have a lot of data on what countries are happiness, happiest. But many years ago, um, Gallup asked a different question. Gallup asked a question about um, what countries ask people, how much meaning do you have in your life? 
And the, the results were summarized by Oishi and Diener. And they point out that the countries that have, um, that have most people answering this question are countries like Sierra Leone, Senegal, Laos, Togo. These are countries that are poor, that are often war-torn, that have low standards of living and, and, and a lot of struggle. And this difference suggests that what resonates, what causes us to experience meaning may be very different from happiness. So for instance, happiness goes up when the GDP of a country goes up, but uh, meaning goes up when the GDP of a country goes down. Or to see the contrast between um, happiness and meaning, consider jobs. So there was a study done of uh, 2 million people, and they broke down the people into 500 jobs that they could have. And here are the jobs that people find the most meaningful, being a member of the clergy, military, social workers, and teachers. And if you think about these, these are not high paying jobs. They're not easy jobs either. They involve struggle and conflict, but people find them meaningful. If you wanna find a job that's um, both high in meaning and high in salary and status, there was only one job on the list, which was uh, surgeons. I'll end with a study um, done by Roy Baumeister and his colleagues that directly pulls apart the issues of happiness and, uh, and meaning. Um, and so what they did was they surveyed uh, many people and they asked them to say how much they agree with a statement like, I consider myself happy, and also a statement like, I consider my life to be meaningful. And um, it, it turns out that, that these answers are correlated so the more you, so this is kind of good news if you want it all, which is a happy life and a meaningful life are not inconsistent. You could have both, but they also pull apart in certain ways. So um, both happiness and meaning correspond to not being lonely, having social connections and not being bored, but only happiness is correlated with health and money. Health and money don't seem to do much for whether or not you find your life meaningful. More time with children is correlated with having a meaningful life and not a happy life. And finally, people who describe their lives are happy, describe their lives as easier with less work and less stress, while people with meaningful lives describe their lives as difficult with more worry and more stress. Finally, um, Baumeister and his colleagues asked people a question without any elaboration. They said, are you a giver or are you a taker? People with happy lives describe themselves as takers. People with meaningful lives describe themselves as givers. There's an artist uh, in Connecticut who, um, who, who, whose artwork is, what he does is he takes um, these postcards, enlarges them, and cuts out the original uh, uh, words at the top and replaces them with, um, with, with words with a quote from literature. And, uh, and I got one of those as a gift. And the quote was um, from Brave New World by Alex Huxley, a dystopian fiction uh, that some of you may be familiar with. And, um, and the quote is from uh, near the end of the book. So if, if you remember the book, in this, in this dystopia, people are happy. People are artificially happy due to behavioral conditioning and genetic modification, most of all due to the ingestion of a drug that makes them happy. And towards the end of the book, um, the, the, one of the representatives of the establishment, Mustafa Mond, is talking to John, a savage. And John's a savage because he rejects all of this. And they have an argument. And Mond kept saying, I don't know why you're rejecting this. We could give you so much happiness. We could give you so much bliss through our chemicals. And John is saying, I don't want any of this. I reject it. And at one point, Mond says, I don't get it. We can give you comfort. And here's John's response. But I don't want comfort. I want God. I want poetry. I want real danger. I want freedom. I want goodness. I want sin. And I think there's no better summary of human nature. Thank you. Hey. Thanks, Nav. Thanks, Professor. I really enjoyed the talk. Um, my question is, well, first off, I was very thought provoked by the slide of your um, theist and atheist and how they found yeah. life meaningful in different varieties. So I'm curious how that ties into one's metaphysical beliefs. Mm -hmm. For example, maybe a materialist finds the world devoid of meaning and static and someone like a panpsychist or an idealist finds yeah. the world more alive and um, connected to it. So how can that kind of relate to how one feels life um, 
full of meaning and hence how much suffering one goes through? It's a good question. Um, my interest is in, my main interest is in the suffering we choose. So I wouldn't expect much of a difference. Both of the oldest people will choose different experiences and choose different projects. But when it comes to suffering that you haven't chosen, I would imagine your metaphysical views more broadly would make a difference in how you perceive it. Um, I talked about data, but being an atheist versus a theist, but you're exactly right. If you believe you're a determinist, for instance, you may take suffering in a different way than if you believe in some sort of free will. If you're a materialist, you may experience, you may, you may have a different ideas about suffering than somebody who's a dualist. And there are people, so here it's just sort of anecdotal, but there are many people who, who argue that certain philosophical positions they may hold makes them miserable because it makes them un, unprepared to confront uh, suffering. And then some people who are sort of advertising for philosophical positions, take my philosophical position, says one of the advantages is it'll make you better prepared to think about and deal with suffering. So yeah, you're totally right. I talked about religion, theism, and atheism, but the point holds more largely to one's philosophy more generally. Thank you. Thank you. So you've covered so much ground here, both in this in the book and in your talk. Um, I'm curious to ask, you know, if you had to sort of narrow it down to a few things, and obviously this isn't easy to do, but what would you say the main sort of practical ways people can apply apply these insights in their life? What would you say things to maybe take away would be? Yeah. Um, I'm not a self-help kind of guy. In some way, I think that these questions are really interesting and worth exploring. Um, I think most people are actually surprisingly good at knowing what to do in their own life. And part of me, my book is sort of sketching out what do people know instinctively that mm. motivates them to do these things? But um, I will say a couple of things. One thing is I think uh, many people forget or don't know about, um, about the value of certain sorts of struggle and anxiety and difficulty. And it's so easy these days to um, get caught up in social media. And there's only technologies built to take us away from struggle and difficulty. And, um, and so, uh, so I think sometimes we got to recognize the simplest thing for me to do is stare at my phone and scroll or watch Netflix or whatever. But I should try to find something difficult. We're going for a run, doing some writing, doing some reading something difficult. And ultimately, this will be more satisfying. I'll also tell you about one finding, which is worth knowing. Suppose you don't believe anything what I say. Just, I say I, I, what a bunch of nonsense. I just want, screw pluralism. I just want to be happy. There's a lot of evidence that finds that trying, paradoxically, trying to be happy is incompatible with being happy. You ask people, how important is it to be happy? How hard do you work at being happy? How much of a priority it is it? And the people who say, oh, very important, tend to be the least happy. Now, now you're a smart guy. You could figure out different ways in which this thing, these two things can be connected. But one interpretation is there's something self-defeating about seeking out happiness. And so that even if it's your top priority, you shouldn't try to do it. You shouldn't try it directly. You should try to enhance other goods like relationships and projects and so on. And then you might be happy as a byproduct of that. Really interesting. Um, so one of the things we spoke about before just in the, in the pre-call was around um, the value of long-term goals. Do you think this is sort of, there, there's something in here as well that you'd maybe like to talk about? I think there is. I think, um, I think one of the arguments against hedonism is that it's, um, it's, it's a short-term goal. It ultimately becomes unsatisfying. Psychologists like to talk about the hedonic treadmill and the ideas of a treadmill is no matter how fast you run, you end up in the same place. And the thing about a hedonic treadmill is something will, you, you will give you pleasure, um, a delicious meal, uh, uh, some sort of physical pleasure. But sooner or later, it will just, you'll just, it'll dilute and dilute. Anybody who ha who's had a new purchase, like a car or a house or something, the tremendous joy at the beginning and, and you know, no longer gives you the same buzz. Long-term goals, long-term projects um, satisfy a different itch and aren't as subject to the, to the treadmill. Um, there's a line from Freud, uh, which he didn't actually say, but I, I often credit it with it, which is the most important things in life are love and work. And um, by love, you could talk, talk about relationships more generally. By work, you'd talk about projects more generally. And they're both long-term things. And I think that gives us 
fundamental satisfaction. Um, I joined this um, lecture basically because I wanted to know about happiness and get, having a happy life. Um, you've actually changed my mind on what is important in, in life. And I think I have more of a meaningful life. But what is more important, a meaningful life or a happy life? And do we put more importance on happiness than we do on meaning? That's a wonderful question. Gemma, it's, it's, it's a question I think, I think in some ways it's the most important question. And you, you talked about happiness and meaning, but we could add some other things to the list. What about morality? What about being a good person? What about uh, some degree of variety? Some psychologists talk about the importance of, of a rich life. Some psychologists talk, what about uh, transcendence and spirituality? And these things can go together sometimes, but often they, they, they could conflict, right? You know, your choice of what the right thing to do I don't know, visiting a sick friend may not be the most fun thing to do. It may say, ah, oh, that's miserable. Make me ruin my day. How do you balance these things, which is more important? Isn't something I can, I can answer. I think what I could do is say, look, it's sort of framed as you've never thought of it, but this is, this is the question. And so each of us individually has to answer the question. How much will I, how much weight will I give to pleasure? Non-zero. I mean, everyone wants some pleasure. Everyone, well, you know, it's a hot day and you get a cold drink. How nice. Um, how much weight will I give to meaning? How much weight will I give to morality? I titled my book, The Sweet Spot, for different reasons. But one, one reason is that we all have to find the right balance between these things. And that, that is a very individual pursuit. Your answer uh, and my answer may be different, but it could both be right. But thank you. Thanks for raising that. I think, I think it's a nice way of sort of, of, sort of framing the question, the, the, the point that my talk is trying to make. Thank you. Thank you. What do you think about, you know, if we were looking in terms of our society's values, what's your perspective on what our society values as a whole? Um, yeah. How do you think about that? I think about that a, that a fair amount. Like, as you know, um, there's no our society. Um, there, there's, there's those damn kids, you know, uh, 19, 20, 21. They got their society. Uh, you know, uh, older people have their society. The, the, the faithful have theirs, um, the, the conservatives, the liberals, there's, there's countless different societies and they all answer the question in different ways. So if I was talking to devout Catholics and I said, well, there's an importance, you know, to meaning and purpose, they'd say, well, you know, who do you think you're talking to? We know this. But I do think that there's, um, that our society, that you would talk about this, has been sort of often caught up in a false idea that pleasure is to be all and end all. I can't tell you how many intelligent, thoughtful people I've spoken to said, look, basically all people want is pleasure, is a buzz of happiness. And I say, I've, I, I, this person told me this who was an incredibly generous man at great cost to himself. And I said, you do all this stuff for other people. Aren't, you don't think morality, you don't think being good is a motivation? And he said, I just do it for pleasure. <laughs> People have the weirdest views about themselves. And, you know, no matter what you do, you can always say, I do it for pleasure. But in some, only in a trivial sense, plainly people have multiple motivations. I think, um, I think as, a, as a crude overgeneralization, modern society has forgotten something which we've known for a long time. And that is the foundation for all the major religions, which is it's not all about pleasure. Not just... I'm not just saying that from a normative standpoint of how we should live, but I'm saying that from a sort of descriptive standpoint of how our psychologies work. We don't just want a good time. We also want, for instance, helping others. We want to make the world, we want justice. We want purpose. And sometimes these will clash with pleasure taken in any literal sense. So I think to some extent our society is, is too interested in pleasure. And do you think that has any link with, you know, maybe increasing seculariz secularization in our society um, since religion has become less popular? I think it does. I think it does. I think I, I'm, um, I'm an atheist myself, so I'm, I'm, I guess, part of the problem in this way. But, um, but religion, religions offer an ethos and a logic and a metaphysics that, that guides us to think there's way more to life than than and pleasure and there could be you know religions for instance may say this worship of god is important um following god's law is important and if you were to say to somebody say well 
isn't it the most important thing having a good time and not following God's law? They would say, you're getting kicked out of the religion, man, because that's the religion, that's his faith. If you're not religious, you it, it opens things up to be more uh, hedonic. And it opens things up to a mistake. But I do want to emphasize that you could be a total full-blown atheist. And still grant there's many different appetites we want to satisfy, different motivations we have. There's nothing incompatible with motivational pluralism and atheism. But you're right. Theism, religion, is in some way a rebuke to hedonism. I wonder here about um, trade-offs. So in everything in life, when you, when, you, when you choose one option, you have to sacrifice another. And... You know, there's things that we do that we we do them because they're meaningful, but we know that we're sacrificing a lot of short-term happiness and stuff in the in the process of doing that. Whether it's starting a company or um, helping helping others or volunteering or whatever, you know, I'm just wondering what are your thoughts on trade-offs, and especially you know, maybe a young person listening to this and they're sitting there wondering, you know. Should I pursue a happy life or should I really make my focus meaning? I think for me, when I was maybe a bit younger, like I was really like the, the goal is, I think, yeah, the goal was meaning. Like I really want to do something meaningful. And I think that has provided a massive amount of motivation and stuff over, over the years. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are on, on that trade off. Yeah, you're asking sort of a variant of Jenna's question. It's a good question um how do you deal with the, with the trade-off and i i don't think there's an answer to that question i think that um that it's be glib for me to say oh focus on meaning and purpose rather than pleasure well i don't know um it depends how great the pleasure is and how big the meaning and and purpose is it's um it's taken to the extreme you could have somebody who denies themselves any any pleasure because they're always after deeper pursuits and i think that's a life that's limited in certain ways so I, I, I think what's important here is to acknowledge the trade-off. What, mm -hmm. what I'm, to some extent, a mature understanding of the world is, um, is appreciating that you can't have it all. And it'd be very sweet if the morally kindest thing to do was also the one that was the most fun and the most one that most furthered my purpose and the most interesting and the most transcendent. But honestly, sometimes the right thing to do is painful and makes you miserable. And, and, so, and it would be really nice if, if, um, if the most fun thing to do was, was connected with purpose, but often purpose and, and meaning detract from pleasure. Even, even in the long term, you have a life which has less pleasure because you decided to go after certain things. And I think we just have to be conscious of trade-offs. But it's not like you have to sort of, you know, say, I, I'm, I'm 22 years old. I got to decide how to rank these different things. And then once I have my ranking, I stick with it. Every day we end up with a million struggles. You know, I'm, I'm, on a, I'm, I'm, I'm rushing to see a movie, but, um, but a friend calls me and say, can you help me, uh, you know, move or whatever. And you got to decide. The answer is not always, oh, do the right thing. Don't go, you know, there's, there's, there's these trade-offs. So motivational pluralism ultimately uh, entails a tragic vision of life because there's just one thing you have to maximize. The sky's the limit, maximize that. But if there's many things that are often in conflict, you, uh, you have to make some hard and tragic choices. And I don't know how one should make those choices. I just know that you should probably accept the value of all of these different pursuits and then uh, wish you luck. Okay. That's really interesting. And so you have, I think we, you mentioned in the pre-call as well that you've written, is it 24 books now, Paul? Is that right? <laughs> no, I've written, I've 20, written uh, six. Yeah, you've been writing for 24 years. And maybe oh, that oh you said? yes. Oh, yes. My, I've, my been apologies. About 20, I've been writing books for about 24 years. And you've worked on a wide variety of projects and on some really interesting stuff. I'm just curious how do you choose what projects to focus on? Like what, what's your criteria? Um, yeah, uh, it's a good question. I don't, I don't have a coherent answer. My early books, some of my books um, stem from my research programs. So I wrote a book called Just Babies about the development origins of morality. And this was, came out from research I did on the morality of babies and the morality of children and sort of a summary of the state of the art and how to think about our moral lives. Um, 
but other books like, and so my book, Descartes Baby, Descartes Baby and How Pleasure Works also came out from my research. I wrote a book before this one called Against Empathy, which was really just an argument I wanted to make about uh, how to think properly about, about goodness. And, um, and my most recent book after the one I'm currently finishing is a general review of psychology. So more and more, at least temporarily, um, my, the books I write have sort of drifted a little bit away from my research. Um, as I've gotten, for better or worse, more confident as a writer, I'm sort of thinking, wow, this is a really interesting project. I want to delve into this. Um, but typically, there's some connection between my day job as a researcher. Very cool. Very cool. Right. Well, Paul, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you with us today. Um, I don't think anybody suffered through that. It was, uh, it was really interesting. Um, so just before you go, have you got any parting words or anywhere you'd like to send people online? Any final, yeah, any final advice for people, people watching the, the webinar? No final advice. Um, I'm, I'm on Twitter at Paul Bloom at Yale. And uh, my email is just type my name into a Google box and get my email. If you have any questions that, that haven't been addressed or any questions or thoughts, I love to hear from people. And thank you very much. Thank you all for attending. And thank you for, for, for the wonderful discussion and uh, questions you've been asking.